So let's move on now to discuss relative entropy, a close cousin of the absolute entropy. So now that you have a sense of what entropy is and how to calculate it, we'll now jump to the topic of relative entropy, which is a way of uh, basically calculating for a given position in a transcription factor binding site, how similar are the uh, distribution of bases that I see in that single position of the, for example, the sequence alignment uh, to the controller unbound fragments. And so essentially like how informative uh, is that position or how important is that or is the base that I see at that position, uh, you know, as measured by its difference to what your average column looks like in the control fragments. Um, and so again, keep in mind that uh, for the purposes of these slides, when I talk about how often we see uh, either an A, C, G, or T at a given position, uh, we're really talking about just considering the set of bases that I see in a single column of an alignment of TF binding sites. Right, and so the, the general goal here of relative entropy is that we're really trying to compare a model of DNA sequences that we see from a single column of aligned TF binding sites that you got from, for example, a chipstick experiment to some model of DNA sequences from the control fragments to see how similar they are. And so the underlying assumption here is that uh, for positions uh, in a TF binding site, they're important to that particular TF's binding or that you know, TF's, TF DNA recognition. Um, those informative or important positions are not likely to look like control fragments, control DNA uh, fragments. And so, um, yeah, again, the, the general assumption is that uh, if a TF is recognizing a specific base of its binding site, if it's very sequence specific, then it shouldn't look like the control sequences that are unbound on average. And so relative entropy uh, is also sometimes called KL divergence. Uh, and again, it's just a way of measuring how different is a position of your TF binding site alignment to your expectation as defined by the control data. And so the most basic kind of, so I've been talking about models of, you know, sequences from your ChIP-seq experiment from one column of that alignment anyways, and models of sequences from the control fragments. And so what I mean in the context of this lecture anyways, by a model of sequences that basically, if I look at one column of an alignment of TF binding sites, I can basically just calculate how often or you know with what frequency do I see uh, a given a given base in that column of the alignment. So just like with the entropy calculations, uh, for a given position in my alignment uh, of the TF binding sites, I can ask the question, okay, what fraction of the bases were A versus C versus G versus T? Uh, and that basically forms my so-called foreground or my model of DNA sequences from my ChIP-seq experiment at a given position. And so here I'm basically calling that model or that distribution of um, frequencies basically P1. And so the difference between relative entropy and entropy is that uh, relative entropy also requires you to have a model of basically the control fragments. And so in this case, uh, we're going to use a simple model where uh, across all of the control fragments that were pulled down by the control experiment in ChIP-seq, for example, we're going to just calculate the frequency of how often I saw each individual base, so each A, C, G, or T, uh, across all the control fragments, and those frequencies are going to form the set of probabilities uh, labeled P2 here. And so both for P1, the foreground, and P2, the background, or the control sequences, uh, I basically have four numbers which give me the frequencies or the probabilities of seeing each of the four bases. And so the equation for computing relative entropy is shown at the bottom of the slide. And so it should look basically pretty similar. Uh, it should look pretty similar to the entropy calculation, uh, although there are some differences because there's P1 and P2 instead of just one single set of frequencies. And so just to give you a walkthrough example of how relative entropy is calculated and um, you know, just to give you a sense of what the number actually means in practice, uh, let's consider an example where, again, we're looking at a single column of 
the alignment of TF binding sites from the foreground, so from the bound fragments. And suppose that in that column, we see uh, the bases AT, 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 right? And so in that column of the TF binding site, basically I saw an A half of the time and I saw T half of the time, right? And so therefore, in my foreground model, my P1 model, uh, the probability of seeing an A was basically four out of eight or half. And the probability of seeing a T was four out of eight or half. And the probability of seeing a G or a C was zero because I didn't see any in that column, right? And so let's assume for the time being that when I look, you know, when you look across all of the control fragments, basically we saw all bases with equal frequency. So all bases were present in 25% uh, each. Right, and so in terms of the relative entropy calculation, basically, again, it looks like, a, you know, we basically for relative entropy, we are looking at each base individually and we're just asking, okay, what's the probability of seeing that base in my given column in my bound fragments? And I multiply that by the log, now it's a log ratio of the probability of seeing that fragment or seeing that base uh, in the control uh, fragments divided by, again, the probability of seeing that base in a particular column of the bound fragments. And so this is basically what the calculation comes out to, um, and uh, basically it comes out to one, a value of one. Um, and so something important to note when you calculate relative entropy is that uh, zero times anything is still considered zero. Um, so even zero log zero is equal to zero in this case when you calculate relative entropy. And so the question you should be asking yourself at this point is, what does the relative entropy of one mean? Um, and so it's kind of beyond the scope of the class to really define what uh, the actual relative entropy number means. But what's more important here is really just understanding what kinds of sequences get higher ent relative entropies than others. And so let's assume again that from our control fragments, we saw that each base was present in basically equal proportion. Uh, so every base was present in about a quarter of the sequence. And so what's kind of interesting is to think about what the relative entropy of a sequence that also has equal representation of all bases. Um, and so uh, say, for example, we were looking at a column of the transcription factor binding side alignment, and we saw the bases ACGT, ACGT. And so all bases are also present in 25% of the time. Uh, if you work out the relative entropy calculations, which I uh, encourage you to do so, then you'd find that the relative entropy is actually zero for ACGT, ACGT. And so on the previous slide, which was a poly AT sequence, we saw that the relevant relative entropy was one. And so basically the point here is that the poly AT sequence has a higher relative entropy compared to ACGT, ACGT, because the base frequencies are more different from the control fragments, right? And so the, the take home message here really is that when you calculate relative entropy, if you see a large positive value, that means that in your column of the TF binding site that you're using to calculate P1, it's more different from your model of the control fragments. And so it's, it's because it's different from the background genome, then it's surprising. What you're seeing is surprising or it's informative because basically it's suggesting that uh, at that particular position of the TF binding site, your transcription factor has a strong preference for bases that you don't typically see in the rest of the genome or at least in the control fragments. Um, and so they're more, that position is more informative. Whereas if you get a relative entropy of zero, that means that at that particular column of the TF binding site, you're seeing exactly what you'd expect to see, at least based on the control fragments, your model of the control fragments. And so what you're seeing there is unsurprising, or it looks just like the rest of the genome. And so the underlying assumption there is that there's no sequence, there's no detectable sequence specificity of the TF at that position of the alignment, at least according to your model of, of uh, TF binding sites.
And so that pretty much concludes our discussion about relative entropy and trying to detect which positions of a TF binding site are, uh, you know, uh, incur sequence specificity of the transcription factor. What I do want to say is that in, in real life, um, people oftentimes try to use more realistic models of TF binding, um, either TF binding or the background control fragments, um, because making the assumption that, you know, treating each column of the alignment or the transcription factor binding site is being independent uh, is a fairly poor model of transcription factor binding because we know that um, that a lot of positions have codependencies uh, between them. So transcription factor doesn't just uh, use each base at each individual position independently when it recognizes it for binding. They, there are um, uh, there are dependencies between the positions when you look at how transcription factor binding sites differ between different sites. And so we won't really talk about what those more kind of realistic models of TF binding are because they are a little bit more complicated. But I do want to uh, leave you with an I idea of um, what more complicated models might mean in kind of a more intuitive, hopefully intuitive example. And so at the beginning of this section of the lecture, we talked about the randomness, you know, how to measure randomness of DNA sequences. And one of the, one of the statements I made was that um, sequences which are predictable tend to have less entropy, right? Because you can, uh, you can kind of guess you know, based on reading, for example, the first half of a DNA sequence, you can kind of guess what the second half will look like. And if that's the case, then that sequence is less random because it's it's predictable. And so most of the time when we are looking at, if you notice carefully, most of the time when we are looking at um, sequences that were predictable, we were mainly looking at like repetitive sequences, like things like poly A tracks. Poly A tracks are, you know, highly predictable and non-random because, you know, no seeing uh, if you see like 20 bases in a row that are all A's, then the chances that the next five are going to be all, A, all A's is, you know, pretty high if you're looking at poly A sequences, for example. Um, but it's important to note that not all, although a lot of these kind of simple repeat sequences are predictive and therefore less random, not all predictable sequences themselves are repetitive, right? And so if you consider, for example, like a sequence of numbers like the five Fibonacci numbers, right? So the Fibonacci sequence basically starts with the numbers uh, one and one. And basically the idea is that the next number in your Fibonacci sequence is the sum of the previous two numbers. Um, and so if you look at the sequence, one, one, two, three, five, eight, 13, you'll see that um, each number is the sum of the previous two numbers in the sequence. And so that sequence there, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, doesn't look repetitive per se, but it is predictable because once you know the first two numbers in the Fibonacci sequence, you can calculate the rest of them. Um, similarly, if you consider, uh, say, something a little more related to uh, molecular biology, if you consider protein coding sequences um, and you consider, for example, codon usage. So what codon usage means is that um, even though, uh, generally speaking, for eukaryotes are, you know, the table, the lookup table that you can use to figure out, um, you know, which uh, triplets basically uh, translate into different amino acids, even though that table itself is relatively fixed across you know, most eukaryotes and so on. Um, you'll notice that for a given amino acid, there are typically more than one codons that encode that amino acid. And so if you look carefully across different organisms, what you'll find is that certain organisms tend to prefer certain codons more than others. If you, you know, if you consider all the protein coding sequences in a given genome, 
uh, you'll find that yeah, the, the codon usage pattern for a given amino acid uh, can differ between genomes. And so what that means is that um, if you are building, suppose you were trying to build a, a model of gene sequences, of protein coding gene sequences, if you know what the, if the codon usage of a genome is, is very skewed, and so suppose that for any given amino acid you only see exactly one codon being used for, to encode that amino acid um, in any of the protein coding genes in that genome, then the protein coding model is, protein coding genes are essentially um, per, like more predictive, more predictable than genomes that use, say, all of the codons for all of the different amino acids equally well. Um, because, for example, if you see a cysteine, if you know there's going to be a cysteine at a given position uh, in a protein coding sequence, then for the genome with highly skewed codon usage, then you know exactly which codon is going to be there, even without looking at the sequence. Whereas for a genome that has that uses all of the codons for, for example, cysteine equally often, then even with that, even armed with the knowledge that you're looking at a you know, cysteine coding uh, triplet, then you still don't exactly know which code, you know, what the DNA sequence will look like. And so basically, in short, when people actually consider the relative entropy of transcription factor binding sites, of individual columns of, of the transcription factor binding site, um, what the relative entropy and how much information is considered to be present at that particular position can actually differ depending on what your model of random DNA sequences based on the control fragments look like. And so just be aware that there's there's more than one way of, of calculating what you expect to see in a given position in a transcription factor body site, uh, depending on how you model the control fragments.